welcome everybody. You know, thanks for taking the time to join us on a Friday evening. And I know uh, this topic is kind of a, uh, you know, you sort of a hit and a miss in, in the sense that we're, we're really deep diving into uh, the Chicago school's core uh, uh, concepts, which is the macroeconomics and the microeconomics. So we're all financials, you know, uh, we take into account uh, the core research and things like that. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our two speakers, uh, Peter. Um, you know, I've had a chance to talk to Peter because he's based out of Malaysia. One of the most active members are, uh, of our uh, Malaysia alumni group. Uh, if there's anything about Fed's policies, uh, what's happening on the macroeconomic side, you know, it's, uh, it's detailed, it's thoroughly researched by Peter. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we've also got a younger member from Chicago. But I wouldn't say younger in the age terms, but maybe because he graduated a bit later. That's Ben. Um, ben has started his own uh, uh, quant fund. Uh, and I know one day he'll, he'll take over AGR research uh, or maybe bigger than those guys. And we wish him good luck. So we've got really two qu contrasting. So with the quant fund, I think he's deciding as to where to invest. Uh, what kind of investment should I take in a V-shaped recovery, U-shaped re recovery? or an L, or we don't know what kind of recovery this is, right? Um, uh, from Peter's perspective, I think we're in a great depression. Uh, but as I see markets have started, you know, in, in, at least me in Kuala Lumpur, July 1st, everybody's out, the businesses have started to come in. So without further ado, let me hand it over to the uh, speakers because they have a lot more insights uh, into this. And uh, uh, I guess, uh, Ben and Peter, it's all yours. Great. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Anand. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'd say that uh, I actually will not be really discussing uh, the uh, forecasts on the economic front, uh, you know, for the very simple reason that, uh, as uh, everyone knows, this really depends on the path of that the virus and the pandemic will take. So uh, it's very difficult to predict, and anyone who uh, tells you that they can predict it is uh, uh, deluding themselves. So. What we'll actually be talking a little bit more about is uh, big picture and uh, uh, what uh, is driving uh, the recovery, at least the recovery uh, in the markets, uh, if not the recovery in the economy. Um, and that really is uh, ultimately central, central bank. So uh, we're going to uh, step back a little bit and talk about what has been happening over the last 30 years. Um, so first of all, you know, I think I'd like to kind of set the context a little bit and talk about, you know, what has uh, led to the explosion of debt uh, that uh, really was, you know, at least partially behind the uh, meltdown that we saw in the markets uh, in, in March. Um, and uh, before we do that, uh, I'd like to just kind of uh, say, you know, in my view, there's really three types of debt. Uh, and this is kind of basic, but let's just get through that. Uh, so there's, you know, the productive debt. So there's debt that, for instance, uh, companies uh, borrow to uh, do capex R and D. Uh, there's debt that governments borrow to, uh, you know, build infrastructure. Or there's uh, debt that consumers, uh, individuals, may borrow to, let's say, invest in their education. So these are productive uh, uh, types of debt, and they're essentially uh, characterized by delivering a positive return uh, in the future. Uh, and then there's consumption debt. Uh, so you know, this does not deliver future returns, but rather uh, it pulls uh, future cons consumption into the present. So this has been obviously uh, more and more prevalent over the last few decades uh, as consumers uh, are uh, utilizing uh, debt in order to uh, pull future consumption in, into the present at uh, you know, a greater and greater uh, volumes. All right, so Peter, do you mind if I jump in? So I, I yeah, totally sure, no. agree. Um, that's actually Amir Sufi's whole research agenda, right? So his whole argument was that preceding the crisis, and you'll get into this, exactly that households are starting to borrow now to invest. You know, I think in standard macroeconomic theory, and I see a couple familiar names here, um, where I may have taught one or two of you, um, we typically have a model where corporate demand is the demand for credit, right? And households are the ones saving to provide credit right, to the firms, right? As Peter mm -hmm. said, the productive use of debt is that the firms borrow money from households on average, right? And then firms invest in new ventures, new development of new technology, software, infrastructure, whatever. 
right? Now, the trend in the past several decades, as Peter mentioned, at least for the United States, um, that's where I know the data the best. Um, Amir Sufi has shown that actually on net, households are net borrowers. So the funny mm -hmm. thing is firms are lending to households and how are they doing it? Via retained earnings. So firms are actually saving and there's like this global rise of corporate savings around the world. So I'll just say, if, you know, Anand introduced me as, a, as a, someone who started a quant fund and that's true. Uh, but first and foremost, I'm an academic, you know, coming out of the PhD uh, program at Booth. And my research also has to do with this. The question becomes, how do you stimulate corporate investment? So I'll, I'll hand this back to Peter. Just, I just wanted to add the flavor that certainly what he said yeah. is true. It's actually one of the biggest puzzles um, in modern macroeconomic um, theory and history as well. We're trying to figure out what's going on. And you know, maybe the central bank has a lot to do with it. So I'd love to hear yep. you know, what, what you'll add. Yep, yep, perfect. Thanks, thanks for that, Ben. Uh, and you know, I think there is also a third uh, type of uh, debt, really, in my mind, which is just purely financial debt. So uh, this is uh, debt that is incurred uh, uh, purely to amplify returns, uh, and obviously, uh, this debt amplifies returns bidirectionally, uh, which, of course, uh, in turn increases fragility. And again, this was the type of debt that uh, you saw behind. Uh, the uh, historical, you know, meltdown, uh, the historically uh, rapid meltdown in the markets uh, around the world in, in March. Uh, and this could obviously be something as simple as just margin debt on an you know, individual's trading account or something more complex, like let's say the treasury uh, are hedge funds uh, that uh, were the first beneficiaries of the uh, multiple, multiple Fed bails out, bailouts uh, back in early March. So not all of you are aware of this, but uh, the first, the very first Fed bailout of the COVID-19 crisis was uh, aimed at these hedge funds that were uh, essentially levered up to 50x uh, and got caught out uh, when uh, the uh, Treasury markets uh, started behaving uh, in a way that uh, they did not expect. So, uh, just moving on, uh, what does this mean in terms of the role of the central bank? So, uh, just by way of background, central banks are obviously quite different around the world, uh, but all serve uh, similarly overriding objectives. I'll, in this discussion, we'll focus primarily on the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, because it's, you know, in a way, obviously the largest uh, and most important central bank in the world, but also, you know, can serve as a proxy uh, for the world's large central bank. So in 1913, when the Fed was founded, uh, its primary mandate was really just to maintain an appropriate level of monetary liquidity and thereby ensure the stability of prices in the economy. Um, and that's important because you know, prior to prior to this, uh, there were obviously uh, very large swings uh, between uh, uh, you know not enough liquidity in the economy and too much liquidity in the economy, which caused uh, very frequent oscillations uh, in uh, the business cycle. So traditionally, the Fed has uh, accomplished this by setting the benchmark interest rates in the U.S. economy. Uh, what changed in uh, the 1970s? was that the U.S., of course, uh, dropped the gold standards in, in 1971. And then in 1977, uh, the Fed role was amended by Congress to the now uh, prevalent dual mandate. Uh, so adding a secondary goal of maximum employment. Uh, those two goals oftentimes are um, not necessarily uh, mutually consistent, and that's led to some issues uh, that uh, we'll, go, we'll get into. Um, in uh, 1997, uh, Ronald Reagan, in order to uh, turbocharge the trickle-down economics program, uh, nominated Alan Greenspan uh, as a successor to the legendary Paul Walker uh, as a chairman of the Fed. Um, and uh, although not officially, uh, Alan Greenspan and his successors uh, since uh, 1997 have really kind of brought a new era of uh, central banking. Uh, that has not previously been seen. Um, and in practice, it added uh, a third, and I would argue an overriding Fed objective, which is to keep asset prices and equity prices inflating at all costs. Uh, and this, of course, uh, became known as the Greenspan put uh, and has been the primary cause of all the uh, movement bus cycles since. So that's uh, 1987, right? That's when Greenspan came in. Yeah, sorry, 1987, my, right. yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, 
for uh, <laughs> correct. Um, so, um, what has the Fed sort of gone uh, done since uh, the Greenspans uh, took uh, the wheel, uh, so to speak? Uh, so, what's important to understand that you know uh, Alan Greenspan was, uh, even though he was uh, you know an academic, he also had his own. Uh, business consulting uh, firm that catered to various uh, less than savory uh, characters uh, within the US uh, economy. Um, and so probably most infamously is his extensive support uh, of the uh, savings and loan fraudster Charles Keating, uh, where uh, Alan Greenspan had done a lot of work for Charles Keating uh, in support of him being able to uh, essentially uh, deviate from uh, the, uh, at the time, uh, bank regulations, uh, which had then later on uh, led to the savings and loan crisis uh, under Alan Greenspan's watch. So uh, what then happened was that basically uh, all types of debt, uh, household, corporate, financial, government debt in the US had exploded uh, following uh, the appointment of Alan Greenspan in 1987 due to decades of far too easy Fed policies. Um, and incidentally or coincidentally, in the 1980s and 90s, the uh, US government was also very busy re-engineering the inflation calculations to ensure uh, in a very self-serving way that price levels continue to appear uh, reasonable to the public. And so, you know, I mean, since uh, then, we, Peter, we've yeah. discussed this also offline. You know, I'm not sure. You know, maybe that was one of the outcomes, but you know, at that time, like we started, economists have started shifting away from standard older measures of CPI towards slightly more updated versions called the pers yeah. Personal Consumption Expenditure Index. Um, yeah, one could argue sense. that yeah. that around that time, you know, like that the PCE is a better measure of inflation because it captures quantity changes rather than fixing a basket. I agree mm -hmm. it, ha it has the side effect. I'm just giving you a hard time, right? I mean, we've talked about this a little no, bit. No, that's already. a good discussion, yeah. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Right, yeah. but uh, I think it's a side effect that there's a lot of benefits for the government specifically to have lower inflation, especially in the time of high inflation. So that era is high yeah. interest rates, fairly high inflation. Um, and we, in fact, you know, looking at it now, we miss those times, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not that obvious to me that the government's gonna actually instituted, you know, some kind of conspiracy to deceive. Oh, no, yeah. No. So yeah, you know, I, I do agree it's, it's a, an outcome of, of that era. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it may or may not have caused some of the problems. You brought up a really yeah. good point with the savings and loan bust. And I know you're about to precede that to move on to the next crisis because, you know, there mm -hmm. really is a pattern with these things, right? There's a cycle, a credit cycle. Um, many economists take it as given that there's all just something fundamental about the economy that drives these cycles. Um, you know, your interpretation of the data is that the Fed is the one that's causing the cycles. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we can discuss this. I think, you know, to some extent, the Fed may be able to alleviate it in the short run at the cost of the mm -hmm. long run, uh, you know, do some kind of weird intertemporal distortion. We can talk about that in a little bit. But these cycles mm -hmm. existed, you know, bubbles and overvaluations. Sure. These things happen way before the Fed was born. Right. It, it, uh, you so know, precisely. But, you know, as, as I was, as I mentioned earlier, the whole point, right, of uh, founding of the central banks was to try to essentially smooth over those cycles. So, you know, stimulate right. when uh, there is a downward uh, pressure and then withdraw that stimulus. Uh, then once, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the cycle swings upwards. Um, and, you know, so they've done one half of that. That's, that's kind of the, you know, that's kind of the issue. And I think that is why we are where we are today, which is, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, the inability, uh, whether politically or, uh, you know, from other uh, right. I forces. Mean, I, I, I broadly agree with the comments that you make. And I, I, so I, I'm sorry to, again, to cut you off. Um, 
and, and yeah. I'll let you finish. And then I'll come to revisit some features of the savings and loan uh, later on as well. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, I'll hand it back over to you um, to pick up after the savings and loan crisis, which, you know, that happened slightly before I was born. So a little bit out of my context, but you're slowly moving into the era <laughs> after I was born. So maybe I'll know a little bit yeah. more. Yeah, so I mean, you know, so there, there were, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but there were obviously uh, a number of different uh, uh, booms and busts. And again, many of them being driven by uh, the far too uh, loose for far too long uh, credit that uh, the Fed had uh, uh, instituted. So, you know, there's obviously the saving, saving and loans bust, the LTCM collapse back in 98. Uh, and then dot-com bubble implosion, <laughs> and, and then obviously then the housing crash and the uh, great financial crisis. Um, now, you know, obviously the great financial crisis was not caused entirely by the loose uh, Fed policy. And yeah, I agree with you, Ben, that, uh, you know, the Fed is only one of the unions, but I would argue it's clearly the driving force, uh, but not the only force. In the case of GFC, you know, it was a combination of the uh, uh, extremely uh, loose uh, monetary policy together with the uh, extreme uh, financial dere deregulation uh, and, and lack of oversight. Uh, so those two forces that really, uh, you know, uh, combined to uh, cause the great financial crisis. Um, so what happened, obviously, just quickly to during that uh, time, as many of us remember, is that uh, the Fed decided to fight the extreme levels of debt uh, with, with even more extreme levels of debt. Um, and so, you know, the ultra, you know, as, as what's happening currently, uh, the ultra loose monetary policy and, more, you know, additional excess liquidity was brought in to try to uh, fight a crisis that was born of ultra loose monetary policy and uh, uh, too much excess liquidity. Um, so the rates were dropped to zero and stayed there till uh, 2015. Um, and uh, in addition to that, obviously, once uh, the Fed had reached uh, the zero bound, uh, uh, as we all know, the, the Fed had uh, embarked on several uh, programs of quantitative easing, um, essentially printing money. Uh, and so in the five years between 2009 and 2014, the Fed had undertook uh, three rounds of quantitative easing. Uh, and then by 2014, the Fed's balance sheet was four and a half trillion dollars. Um, so this was five times its uh, pre-great financial crisis uh, size. And so I so think the to number the itself though might is a bit misleading because you know, when we're looking at money supply in the economy, right, uh, there's base money, which is what the Fed prints, right, whenever it, it conducts open market purchases, that's base money, right? And there's a money multiplier. And the role, uh, you know, who generates the money multiplier? It's you and I, it's our decisions to save, and it's banks, right? right? So it's a the mixture velocity of, of people, money, yeah. mm -hmm. that's right, and banks. Now, mm -hmm. what has happened since the financial crisis is you're right that the Fed balance sheet has expanded tremendously, but the money multiplier has collapsed. And mm -hmm. if you look at banks now, they have a lot of excess reserves. I think I want to, yes. you know, I, I interrupted because that's a kind of a crucial moment for the Fed, because I think that's when they started taking systemic risk extremely seriously at that time, right? Ben Bernanke's whole career was studying the Great Depression. One of the biggest mm -hmm. issues with the Great Depression was that America at that time, without the Federal Reserve, allowed banks to start failing, right? And so when banks start failing, they take part of the money supply with them, right? And you can enter into a deflationary spiral, right? So everyone looks at Japan and says, yeah, we don't want Japan. Now, the question becomes, you know, with these new mandates for the, for the Fed, now that they're caring also about systemic risk, Sometimes in terms of, you know, trying to come in to save the market, like in the most recent crisis, we get some weird distortionary behavior, right? You yeah. see that you mentioned you started with the hedge funds who are playing in the treasury market, were incurring losses, liquidity suddenly was freezing up, and there's a flight mm -hmm. to liquidity around mid-March this year, 
and then the Fed intervened extremely aggressively, right? Yes. And so the, the flip side of that is on one hand, it probably saved us from a big liquidity crunch. Inherently, we don't like fire sales because the definition of fire sales is you're selling the asset at lower than the fundamental value because the market is being dislocated. Right. So on one hand, it looks like we survived uh, a huge liquidity crunch. Uh, on the other hand, though, it's hard to also see what's enough. Right. And I see there's some comments here in, in the Q&A also, you know, it's like excessive. And then the question of excessive, yes. I think, is, is fairly hard to define. Um, and, yeah, I, I'd like to see what you think about that. But I do want to yeah. note that looking at the expansion of the balance sheet alone is extremely misleading. I think overall money supply has increased. I agree with that, but probably to a lot less of a dramatic extent than the Fed's balance sheets. Well, yes and no, Ben. I mean, I think if you look at, uh, you know, the proportion over, over the last 30 years of, let's say, both, you know, M2 and, uh, you know, the debt uh, overall in the economy, you know, the two are obviously but related. M2 is not really money, right? I mean, we usually think of money as M0. So yeah, M2, yeah, I agree, well, you're including short-term loans. And we'll get to that sure. in a second, that there's a yeah. huge distortion no, in the in the lending market. Exactly. But that is, that is that, and well, M2 traditionally is what, you know, what, what uh, is a key driver, right, of what's, what happens in the economy. And so that's my point is, you know, the Fed has, you know, the Fed over the last three years has moved from supporting the economy to supporting the markets. And that is you know, the, my fundamental thesis. And that is the fundamental problem that we find ourselves in. You know, this uh, uh, connection that, you know, Alan Greenspan uh, has uh, put forth that markets drive the economy is, is the tail wagging the dog quite simply. And, you know, that whole concept, which has you know, never been empirically proven, uh, is what the Fed has basically based its entire policy on, and it's wrong. Right. I, um, I want to pick up on what you mentioned there, because um, there, I, I agree broadly with the trends. And I, I want to highlight one more thing, which you know, I think gives mm -hmm. a bit more insight into your statement. So I think overall, it, it agrees. But uh, what we're looking at would be um, when the Fed comes in to intervene in the market, right? Now it's trying to save the market from having huge fire sales, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's trying to save the market from big liquidity dis disruptions. What that does is it clearly disrupts the market mechanism, right? So it's kind of weird, right? You think that the Fed is out here to protect the market. However, when the market is about to correct something, Right, the Fed yes. steps in and says, "Wait, don't don't do that." You know, we need to yeah. save these companies, and yeah. we do get weird distortionary behavior where firms that are able to last and survive has have issued very recently yeah. a huge amount of debt at very yeah. low prices. So, example like Amazon issued, I think, two trillion or, or two two billion, uh, mm. two billion, you know, three year bonds of like zero point five percent. Right, this is like the cheapest mm -hmm. in history. Um, versus yes. the smaller companies, right? You know, you think of SMEs, uh, credit constraint companies. Um, these are actually the companies that you would want to provide liquidity to in bad times, right? So, right. you know, we get this weird behavior where those companies are suffering quite a lot. And we do see that in the market, mm -hmm. right? But on the yeah. other hand, the bigger companies, the more stable ones, with this liquidity injection, the market says, wait, this is actually a good time now to actually issue more debt, right? Yes. And that's what, that's what we see is happening. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I mean, you basically, you know, the, the central banks around the world have basically uh, broken the price discovery mechanism, right? So while I agree with you that, you know, central banks to some extent need to, you know, intervene and ensure that, uh, you know, you don't uh, effectively have a downward spiral in the markets, uh, so, which is what happened during the Great Depression. So they do need to inter intervene to stabilize prices at some level. Uh, that's not what's been happening, right? The, the, the central banks have intervened to inflate prices. So I think that that is the key distinction, right? And I, I do want to notice there that you're, the, what you call prices there is strictly security, financial securities, right? In terms yes. of prices, inflation, 
we actually have seen yeah. very moderate inflation, right? And so yeah, because correct. of that, um, you know, yeah. I think one could make an argument that when Janet Yellen was in charge, right, the mandate is stable inflation, systemic stability, so no banks failing, right, taking with them the money supply, plus mm -hmm. full employment, right? You know, it took a long time to get out of the financial crisis, uh, a lot of research suggests part of that's because this was a, by construction, a financial crisis is debt laden. And when you have a lot of debt overhang, it takes a long time for, to, to get out of debt overhang and for good investment opportunities to show back up and actually get invested in. Uh, yes. So, you know, we do see, like at the same time, we do see firms issuing a lot of debt right now. I think you could make a case that maybe the role of the central bank in taking, it should take more seriously the role of systemic risk by looking at a lot more, you know, debt issuance indicators, right? So Amir Sufi's paper, I think it's coming in the quarterly journal of economics has this beautiful chart where he just shows, you let's look at what's the debt run up, right? And in two years, it predicts a recession, right? And so if you have bigger debt run up, it predicts a recession in two years. Right. And yeah. similarly, we do have other price based mechanism, right? Cam Harvey has a yield curve, um, the yield curve inverted, right? People freaked out when the yield curve inverted, but, and it's shown that the yield curve has had a hundred percent success rate since the 1980s. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to pull apart his research or, or bring up his research partly also because he's a Chicago graduate. Uh, for, you know, that was his thesis in 1988, set the bar very high for us PhD students. Um, but I think what gets lost in that comment, and I'd love to, to see what you think, is that, um, is that after the yield curve inverts, on average, okay, the recession shows up in the next about 12 to 13 months. And on average, in those 12 to 13 months, the market continues to increase by quite a lot. Right. And so if yeah. the yield curve oh, inverts, you pull your money off, out, yeah. you're right. You're <laughs> missing up a lot of gains and then you feel like you need to make up for it by re-entering the market again. Right. Now, yeah. uh, we'll get to this in a little bit as well as we're talking about, you know, as investors, how does one try to navigate this new world? Right. I mean, I think you're pointing out to some of the fault lines in the system and it may materialize mm -hmm. or it may not. Because um, when we're going back to the savings and loan crisis in the late 80s, uh, the government set up what are called bad banks to actually take a lot of the bad loans, right? All the right. zombie loans, the companies that were so underwater with all these bad loans and, and actually got rid of them using a market-based mechanism. The government comes and says, we'll subsidize the banks. We'll take them off your books. So you're still survive and not cause a financial crisis. And then we let the market try to, you know, buy these non-performing loans. Uh, something fairly similar is happening now in China, and that's my current area of research, and it's tied together with your story because the same economic mechanism is going to be driving right, many economies in the world, this kind of big debt buildup. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about, and I know you'll pick up on this again, and I think we'll continue to discuss it, um, what are some of the resolutions, right? So how do we get yeah. out? of this. I think, you know, there are several mechanisms there that with the bad banks in particular, uh, you know, it's a technical term, bad banks. They're designed to hold bad assets. Those were largely uh, successful in doing that. Uh, but I think in, again, in saving the financial system, there can create some distortionary behavior, right? So yeah. you're pretty much protecting somewhat the asset prices from fully correcting um, yeah. And I do think yeah. there are, there are other, you know, spillovers. And I think it's worth discussing some of the spillovers. So I'll, I'll let yeah. you pick up on some of that. Yeah, I think, you know, like we're jumping ahead a little bit. So let's, let's maybe just kind of finish, you know, laying the groundwork and talk about, uh, you know, what, just do a quick recap of what uh, the Fed had done, uh, you know, in the last uh, year or so, um, because, you know, it, it is relevant, which is that, uh, you know, in, uh, You know, basically what happened was uh, there, you know, when, when Jay Powell had come uh, in, uh, there was an effort uh, 
to try to reduce you know the balance sheet that, as the Fed had uh, been promising uh, for you know almost a decade at that point. So uh, they did manage to reduce it, as I'm sure everybody remembers, to uh, three point uh, three and three quarter trillion um, as of September 2019, and then you know the stock market started wilting, and then the Fed you know, jumped in again and. Uh, over the next six months or so had uh, ratcheted up uh, the balance sheet back to the previous record of four and a half trillion. So, you know, one thing that's keep in mind is, you know, there's a lot of discussion uh, that the economy was healthy, uh, at least the U.S. economy uh, was healthy prior to COVID-19 and then COVID-19 came out of nowhere and, you know, kind of uh, uh, harpooned the U.S. economy. And, you know, in my view, that's not entirely true. You know, I think they were definitely, as you mentioned, then, you know, the yield curve uh, inverting, uh, you know, and uh, obviously with the Fed panicking and, uh, you know, <laughs> going to uh, QE5 uh, in the months before COVID-19. So all of these were definitely signs of major cracks developing. So, uh, you know, my view is that COVID-19 pandemic was uh, just the pin that break the bubble. It was not necessarily, you know, the cause, uh, but ra rather the catalyst or the accelerant uh, of the issues that we see today. Um, so, and, you know, I'm not going to go in a great amount of detail as to, you know, what the Fed had done in the last few months, but uh, let's just suffice to say it's, uh, you know, very, very unprecedented, you know, in, in particular, uh, the Fed's uh, support of the credit markets has been uh, extreme, to say the least, uh, including, uh, you know, going in and, and you know, uh, doing the primary and secondary market facilities uh, for even the fallen angels, so junk bonds. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially uh, spurring this uh, orgy of, uh, as you mentioned, Ben, uh, uh, additional uh, corporate uh, debt uh, uh, leveraging, uh, you know, for companies that, you know, in, a, in essence had uh, spent $4 trillion in aggregate of mostly borrowed money over the last decades repurchasing their own shares. So, you know, I think the, you, you keep saying, you know, what is enough and what's excessive. Um, you know, I think most people and most investors today, you know, would agree that what the Fed has done uh, over the last few months you know, has been excessive. And we are now already seeing the uh, consequences of that in, you know, the spurt of uh, additional increases in, in leverages, uh, in leverage uh, at, at, on the corporate balance sheets. So uh, what does that mean then, you know, for the real economy um, and then society overall? You know, what are the consequences of this uh, excessive liquidity uh, uh, for the economy and, and, and the society. So, you know, I think there's definitely, you know, it's very difficult to uh, untie cause and effect. Um, so it's very difficult to see whether things are just, you know, correlated or whether there's causality. Uh, but I think we can clearly observe that uh, there's been a dramatic decreasing uh, and, and productivity uh, in the real economy. So ossifying, if you will, uh, of the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, my argument is that that has been, you know, at least partially driven by the excessive uh, liquidity of the central banks around the world. Uh, so just to give you the numbers, uh, if you compare the pre-Great uh, Financial Crisis period, 2000 to 2007, to the post-Great uh, Financial Crisis period, 2011 to 2016, uh, the total factor productivity uh, had dropped by 70% uh, in advanced economies and by over 50% in emerging uh, markets. So uh, this is obviously a crisis you know, for the economy because clearly if there's no productivity growth uh, and there is slowing, uh, uh, there's slowing uh, growth in a population, then the underlying real economy can't grow, right? So because that, those are the right. only two drivers so of. Uh, I, I, I agree with that, right? The only country now that's really benefiting from the demographic dividend, right, is India, and many yes. other advanced nations are having aging population, right? And I, I agree with you that when the Fed comes in to buy corporate bonds, those are fallen angels, 
you know, we look at it, many of those fallen angels probably deserve to go through an orderly unwinding of the company, right? Because yeah, they're absolutely. bloated Chapter business 11, models yeah. and balance sheets. Um, yeah. So th that one I really agree with. So my, some of my research is on the impact of unconventional monetary policy. In particular, I, I studied Japan in, in quite a lot of detail. Um, but even before Japan, even, you know, Japan has been doing unconventional stuff for decades, right? And I think people of at least U.S. academics have largely ignored them and said, we just really hope we don't get into Japan's shoes because none of and what then, they do is starting to work. <laughs> and then actually, what, what I, I would actually have, have a uh, uh, slightly different take on that, which is that, you know, countries like the U.S. would be lucky to uh, be able to become what Japan has become, right? And, you know, I would argue that sort of the societal uh, uh, unique characteristics of the Japanese population ha have been what has been able to sort of enable Japan to thrive, you know, despite decades of, of economic stagnation. Uh, so, you know, I would, uh, I would actually add that uh, I think, uh, you know, countries like U.S. or many European countries would be lucky if they could reach uh, the Japanization that everybody likes to talk about. Anyways, go right. Ahead. I mean, I can kind of see that point, but you know, as an economist, I try hard not to think that, oh, it's culture or race or some, you know, inherent characteristic. Yeah. I think Europe to a large extent has approached more what Japan looks like. The ECB yes, started yes, buying a lot of right. corporate bonds and mm -hmm. lo and behold, the purchases of corporate bonds did nothing to stimulate corporate investment. Right. So in my research on the Bank of Japan, you mentioned <laughs> yes. it's exactly right. Hard to disentangle correlation versus causality. Yes. In Japan, we had a unique chance to actually tease out causality because of some of the <laughs> weird mechanisms. And what we showed was actually that when the Bank of Japan steps in to buy equity. OK, so we think that's like the final frontier when you actually buy equity of the firms to try to boost their price. Um, they succeeded in boosting the price. However, they succeeded also in not pushing investment at all. And so what we estimated were fairly precise zero effects on corporate investment. And the companies that actually did those investments tend to be what we would think of as zombie firms. So firms that are poorly governed, fir firms that have not so many investment opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, once you get to the world where you're looking at so many unconventional tools, probably you're not going to get a lot of bang for your buck. I do and, want and to in bring... The, in the U.S., I mean, you, you already have, you know, also a large percentage of zombie firms. So, you know, according to some right. of the Wall Street yeah, research, so, it's you know, 20 percent of U.S. firms. I mean, the average leverage ratio in America is still about 25 percent. So it's actually not that high. Um, but there are firms whose productivities are very low, who've kind of been hanging in there for a long time, right? And I think the concern yeah. is whether or not we're going to make them into zombie firms, right? I mean, there's good arguments exactly. from labor economics that because of labor economic frictions in terms of hiring, firing, and retooling people, that when COVID came, the number one thing is keep the firms alive just to save the jobs. Now, what's missing from that argument is that after you save those jobs, you still need to find a way to get rid of the bad companies. You can't save all the bad companies also. Yeah. Now, the Fed, I mean, the Fed's policy instrument is extremely blunt, right? They move price, the price of money today versus tomorrow, right? This one number, with this one number, they're hoping to hit their mandate. And unsurprisingly, by just having that one tool, um, you could cause a lot of, a lot of distortion. Now, especially when they step into the market to buy corporate bonds, I think that's one of the worst decisions they've made. Um, and now you're actually yeah. doing the credit allocation. So that's really a dangerous game to get into, right? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, mm -hmm. historically you segment out fiscal policy, those that are more targeted, aiming to do redistribution, right? From monetary policy, which has to do about right. macroeconomic policy. Increasingly, I think, you know, there's a lot more research looking at the distribution across firms, right? Some firms are more constrained than others. If you save the ones that are not constrained, but you let the constrained ones die, you kind of miss the point there, right? And so, you know, maybe we live in a world where it, where it calls for a much more targeted policy, right? Now, you know, I, I'm interrupting a bit your flow of like kind of the in the Fed type argument, 
right? Uh, but you know, my perspective is that is that it's fiscal policy's role to do a lot of the redistribution. So yeah, a lot of no, the pains that exactly we have right, now, yeah. right, I wouldn't dump it on the Fed. I would dump it on, I mean, I reveal a bit my political alliance, but <laughs> I, I would dump it on actually fiscal policy, right? That it's the fiscal yeah. policy's role to do good credit allocation. And if anything, they're probably doing the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to route money to companies that don't really need them. And they just use the subsidized loans to lever up further. Um, yes. You know, I think one question is, is it a redistribution problem? I think there is a redistribution problem and that's creating some of the distortions in the economy. I think we're, we're in agreement there, right? I think where we kind of, where we differ is um, what are the ways out of this, right? So, you know, what, what do you think? I know you have like different scenarios in mind, so maybe you can share a bit. Yeah, look, uh, you know, I think... <laughs> Uh, my personal view is that, uh, and you know, this this may sound dark, but you know, I think there is really no way out of it. You know, ultimately, and I think we're jumping ahead a little bit, but you know, I think uh, you know what we've been seeing over the last thirty years is that you have you know ever escalating levels of debt. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, but you know, on all on 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 the you know financial sector, corporate sector, consumers, governments, uh, debt is really you know. Uh, basically going to historical extremes. Uh, the central banks then are forced to keep interest rates uh, artificially low in order to, you know, continue to uh, keep the Ponzi scheme going. Um, you know, the resulting financial repression then forces the savers to increasingly riskier investments. So you're turning, uh, you know, savers into uh, speculators uh, as they go up to the risk spectrum. Um, and this then increases valuations to you know, extreme levels, uh, which then causes the markets to crash frequently. Um, and because the, you know, as we talked about, the price discovery mechanism uh, is broken uh, by the Fed, uh, the Fed are, has no choice but to continue to you know, re-inflate the markets. So, you know, the central banks and the governments continue to basically uh, have extremely loose monetary policy and uh, increasingly, as we've seen, uh, extremely uh, aggressive uh, uh, fiscal uh, deficit policy. Um, and then each of the crises then redistribute and, and further increases the debt, uh, privatizing the gains and socializing the losses. Um, and then the entire boom bust bailout process repeats and, and transfers uh, trillions of dollars from uh, the masses to kind of the, the you know, top 1% of the 1%. Um, the problem obviously is that, you know, as we've seen the debt multiplier, so the, the, the juice that you get from layering additional debt in the economy has, has collapsed everywhere around the world from the US to China and everywhere in between. So you need more and more and more every time. Um, and then you arrive at a point where we you know, are starting to get to, which is what you referred to Ben, which is where uh, you know, fiscal and monetary, uh, even though it's supposed to be separate, fuse together. Uh, and you see that more and more in the US and, and elsewhere. Um, and you know, the uh, central banks then print money to directly monetize debt. Um, uh, and right, and we're back at the original sin, right? That's the emerging that's market are. level macroeconomics. Exactly. I mean, that I had that concern as well. Um, and I would have that concern, but I have several colleagues or friends who are working, you know, not high up, so they're not pure policy makers, but at least mm -hmm. in the ground at the Fed, they, they still take that stuff very seriously. The question is, of course, at the top level, you know, how much of this is going on? I, and I agree. Yeah. Uh, I do want I mean, to you add saw, You saw Paula and Mnuchin being, you know, becoming best pals, right? <laughs> I mean, so that tells you everything. Yes. No comment. Um, but <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt both of your flow, but I think uh, we may have about another five minutes to wrap because there's quite a few questions as well. Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah, sure. No by 6.40, I close it, but I think but, it's such an interesting topic, and I want to give uh, opportunities for everybody to sort of ask some interesting questions, and I have yeah, a few absolutely. questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so okay, let me just add the final caveat, because I think, you know, Peter, you laid out a good groundwork of what has happened. I think the caveat is that 
at least at this point in history, um, the United States monetary system is still special compared to other emerging markets, right? So mm -hmm. what you talk about original sin, senior edge printing money to pay government debt, right? And this is just inflating. Um, we think that's, you know, honestly, many economists make fun of it almost like it's like an emerging market economy problem, right? Yeah, um, not at all. Yeah. There is something special about the U.S. economy in that as of now, at least, U.S. has exorbitant privilege. What that means is yes. liquidity is defined in U.S. dollars, Correct. right? And actually, there's a decent argument that I have seen, at least, to be make, made that um, we don't even have enough treasuries. There are not enough safe assets. So <laughs> the treasury should issue more debt to create safe assets for people to invest in. Um, <laughs> you know, so the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that we shouldn't take lightly the U.S.'s debt capacity, right? And even Japan has a debt to GDP ratio. A lot of JGBs that are being issued are, are just issued in order to be bought by the Bank of Japan, right? And yes. they're at a, at a debt to GDP ratio of about 250, 300%. And actually that for them still looks sustainable, right? And so one of the questions that Mario asked was, is inflation a concern? Um, can the U.S. or central banks print away the stuff in a downturn. Um, the nice thing is the Fed controls the U.S. dollar. They can print as much of the U.S. dollar as they want. The question, and going back to what Peter brought up, is you know, to what extent are we going to start tipping the scales and the markets are going to start to unravel? Um, at this point, I don't think inflation is a concern. I think David raised a good point that haircuts were $5 and now they're $10. Um, but, you know, I appreciate the anecdote, yeah. right? But the data suggests slightly different. Um, but granted, I don't get many haircuts anymore with the lockdown <laughs> my wife is doing my hair. Uh, but I still think there's room in terms of inflation. And I, the, I used to have a concern that suddenly inflation might spike very fast um, because bank excess reserves are really huge, right? And so if banks suddenly decided to lend a lot more, we can actually get a huge expansion in credit supply and a big jump in the money multiplier, actually boosting a lot of money into the system. Um, but part of the Fed's financial stability mandates um, actually with macroprudential regulation are curbing, you know, they're actually more regulating what the banks can do. Um, so to some extent that there's a twist of what banks are doing versus what the Fed is, right? Fed is going more directly to lending, buying corporate bonds, and then they're restricting what some of the banks can do. I think the question becomes like, what about that balance, right? And how, can you maintain that balance? And I, I do think that's an open question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I think that uh, Mario's question about, you know, uh, is inflation a concern? I think I would agree with you, Ben, is that, you know, there's definitely been much milder inflation, you know, the last, 30 years or so than in the previous uh, you know, uh, decade or two, at least in the US, right? Uh, uh, you know, at the same time though, you know, I think that uh, the inflation is definitely higher uh, than you know, what the US uh, government statistics would indicate. It's certainly not you know, two or three times higher, but you know, obviously with the inflation levels that we're at, if you're talking about one and a half percent versus two and a half percent over time, that makes uh, a significant uh, difference. The other point, which is, you know, uh, interesting point, and obviously a little bit, uh, you know, I think not necessarily mainstream, but, you know, we just take it as, as, as given that we should only focus on uh, CPI, right? Question is, what is inflation, right? Inflation is uh, essentially when there is a distortion between, you know, the uh, amount of money in the system versus the amount of stuff in the system, right, to put it uh, in a layman's terms. And so why are we excluding assets? Right? That's always been my question. Why, why are we only fo focusing on uh, consumables and not necessarily on assets? So, you know, I think uh, in my mind, central banks should be just as worried about asset price inflation, whether it's, you know, real estate uh, or stocks or, 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 you know, other assets. Uh, which can over time, if, you know, it goes to the extremes that we're seeing yeah, now, I mean, I, I, cause problems, I agree. right? 
the question I mean, becomes, I, well, why, though, who should be doing that, right? I mean, well, the, I mean, that's the role of the central banks, as we had, dis, as your, we had agreed at the your beginning, comment right? Was Stability. after railing against the central bank, your solution is we need to give central banks more power and an additional mandate. No, but that is that. No, 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 that is their. I mean, my my view that is their power, right? We, we that's what we talked about. Right? When the Fed was founded in 1913, that was their number one mandate. You know, basically uh, ensure asset price stability. And so that, to me, does not just mean CPI. And that means asset price. That means asset. That, that means price stability, including assets. Right. So Actually, that means yeah, that, I mean, you, that part, you should not. I agree. Yeah. You know, so, you should not have. You should not have markets going up. You know, you should not have the Nasdaq going up. You know, forty percent or whatever it's been over the last few weeks. I mean, that's I'm, absurd. I think they the misconception I, I i agree partly because i uh what the data is showing in the recent experience is kind of extreme but i think yeah. by and large over the long term since 1980s right the fact that multiples are changing or at times the multiples are increasing they can reflect future <laughs> cash flow right and i think it's a very tough game to enter if you're trying to say what is the right expected cash flow right? And what's the right level of the multiple. Um, but I, I do agree with you that there is a disconnect in, in asset prices now. And so Anand, if you don't mind going to the next slide, you know, I think the question for us, you know, and I'm bringing this back to kind of, you know, fund management, right? Um, for, for us as investors, what are some of the implications, right? So in the most recent period. Uh, I showed you this plot before. I think it's broadly in line with what you said, where it's some kind of price dislocation. So what we're looking at here is a time series plot from the beginning of the year. And we're looking at what I call quote, quote, quant strategies. We're separating them out, right? So value and dividend investing is one of them. And since the beginning of the year until now, dividend investment, these are long short portfolios have lost about 20%. Right. And however, the market is kind of fully recovered. Right. But value and dividend investing has not. So that's exactly in line with multiples rising. I think the tough question becomes, you know, in trying to navigate this stuff, um, it's not obvious to me that, you know, a systemic breakdown is inevitable. Right. Um, there are many exit points for the economy. Now, many of those granted, I think are policy based. So, you know, maybe I have more faith in economic policy <laughs> than, than you. Um, and I think we can agree to disagree there. But, you know, I think living through this experience, I do want to note a couple things. And this comes from uh, a professor at Chicago now, his name is Stefan Nagel. Um, his research actually shows that individuals are highly affected by their personal experience. That is, if you've lived through a period of high inflation, you invest and save and, and, and borrow and lend as if there's high inflation forever. Um, mm -hmm. And if you were born in an area of low inflation, right, you didn't experience hyperinflation, you appear to not take inflation risk seriously. Um, you know, so that's where I think Anand started the talk with, you know, the Great Depression and quant funds, you know, where what I'm trying to do at Chicago Global, where we're trying to kind of thread the needle is, um, can we pick up and unbias ourselves, right? We know that the people make these generational mistakes. And interestingly, and you would like this, Peter, Stefan Nagel's most recent paper actually shows that even central bankers' personal experiences affects how they do policy. So these are people who are supposed to be experts and only based on data, right? But Stefan actually used data on, on individual votes in FOMC meetings, and he actually ties deviations from the consensus to people's uh, personal experiences, yeah. right? So the question for us is like, going forward, how are we gonna be looking at this? Yeah, I think it's a very important point because I think the one question that really overrides all this is that whatever metric you look at, we are at the extreme. Right, we are at not just our not just generational extremes, we're, we're at human experience extremes, uh, and and that's that that's quite remarkable. I mean, whether you look at debt to GDP, uh, you know, uh, government levels, uh, you know, consumer levels, corporate levels, 
uh, maybe not financial sector levels those have come down a little bit but you know almost every metric we are at an extreme of history right um likewise you know with with, with valuations we are at extremes of history uh, likewise with uh you know interest rates so the question is if we extrapolate the current trends where does this go i mean it's it's quite simple, right? If you look at it, we can on, on on these various metrics. Let's say let's take debt to GDP, right? So we can go one of three ways. We can go sideways. So what does that mean? That means probably very 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 low growth, right? We can go uh, deliver, which is the Japanese uh, experience, right? Which, well, yes and no. I mean, the, the, low <laughs> the Japanese body. had sort of reallocated the debt. Uh, you know, they shuffle it around, but but yeah, so, you know, partially. Uh, so we can deliver, which would be, you know, obviously the, the, the intelligent thing to do, but that's never going to happen. Um, or we can continue to pile on debt. And then the question is, well, okay, where does it end? Right? That's the real question. Where does it end? Next time, you know, there will be another crash. There's no doubt. So what is the Fed going to do then? Right? Because essentially what you're doing is, you know, as we've seen with this experience, every time the Fed has basically done two or three times what they did in the previous crisis. And so, you know, again, I don't know the, the answer US to can this. print as many U.S. dollars as it wants. The question becomes, if a yeah. correction is coming, how dramatic that correction will be? Or are we going to need to get bunkers, right? And then buy guns, right? And store up <laughs> on canned food, right? In which case, you know, uh, dividend or sorry, uh, value investing would be the way to go, right? Right. I mean, yes. I, 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 I agree on the facts, right? Your forecast differs from mine, um, but you know, I'm not in this job to do forecasts. So we look at the data, right? And so, you know, in the data, you're right. There seems to be some hype, right? The momentum returns tend to actually was up about 25% year to date, right? Yeah. And this is despite the market kind of going nuts. And so, you know, because we can't quite forecast it, you know, I would say that to, to protect yourself, right, one way to do it is stay out of the market, buy gold, buy bunkers, buy guns, <laughs> right? The other is yeah. we tilt the portfolio a little bit. And I think that's where you and I agree that valuations are very high, right? I think your response to it versus what we try to do is slightly different. Well, we are a little less extreme in, in trying the high conviction bets. Um, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, the, the, the thing is that we're always making history, right? Um, always. And so it's really hard to forecast. I mean, we're not in the game of doing forecasts. You I can't. agree that there yeah. are several scenarios, right? Some may be more likely than others. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, if you know for certainty, they're probably tricking you. Right. And so I'm not going to make, I, I don't take any stance. And part of you know, our investment process is we don't forecast the future, but we're letting the fundamentals drive. Right. And, yes. you know, I think where we might agree is that the Ponzi scheme, as you call it, or rather valuation ratios, as I call it, <laughs> uh, you know, they can't blow up to infinity. Right. And I agree that if right, they are exactly. blowing up Ponzi scheme style, we have way more things to worry about than yeah. portfolio. Which is, which is what they are. And, you know, I think, I think you're absolutely right, which is that you, you know, you have to be in market, right? Clearly, you know, because it's the Tina trade, right? There is no alternative. <laughs> and, you know, I think that is, that, that, that's not, uh, that's not a bug. That's a feature of the system, uh, you know, right. That, that drives everyone into, to do, you know, this, frankly, you know, reckless things. Um, I think what, what's interesting, uh, you know, which is what we had discussed before, is that, yes, you know, clearly have to be in the market. The, the question that, that I find quite interesting, actually, when I look at the market is that, yes, you know, obviously there's this enormous uh, liquidity tsunami that's, that's powering the global markets and the, you know, overall valuations and multiples. W what I find very interesting is that there is also a, uh, enormous dispersion uh, of valuation within the market. So that you can't explain, right? You can't explain that uh, by looking at the Fed because, you know, the Fed just shovels, you know, prints dollars and shovels them into the market to, to, to be blunt, right? Uh, but the, the Fed doesn't say, okay, well, you have to buy, you know, lemonade or whatever the latest crazy IPO is, right? right. Uh, so, you know, 
that's the interesting thing is, how do you explain the fact that, you know, as we had discussed, you know, there was a Goldman Sachs, a uh, pretty in-depth study that, that they've done recently, where they looked at uh, dispersion between the, the bottom quintile and the S&P 500 and the top quintile. Um, and it's at just absolutely historical uh, levels. Uh, and it's really well, fascinating. Clear, historical levels is close to dot-com era. Right, so it's it's not as far away. Oh, as it's it's think. even beyond that. Yeah, beyond beyond dot com era. Yeah, no, no, I'm talking about the dispersion specifically. Right, I'm, I'm yeah, talking so, about. Yeah, so right, so that's the so, value factor spread, right? Yes, and exactly, the, the, exactly. So, so we're, at, we have just crossed at, into dot com era. I mean, there are various measures. Some are better than others, yeah. but if you use a composite, it, it I think it broadly says something similar. Right, we're at yeah. extreme levels, and I think the missing thing in this equation. Um, is that when the Fed acts, we respond. We as in people, investors, right? Mm -hmm. And so the Fed might be the tide that lifts all boats in theory, right? But investors can actually, you know, distort the market, right? And yeah. I think we see a lot of headlines of, you know, individual investors coming in at weird times, right? <laughs> For example, buying Hertz stock after it yes. went bankrupt. You know, it could have been the first, child of this whole yeah, thing. Yeah, right. Absolutely. It could have been the first time in history a bankrupt company issues worthless stock at positive prices. I was kind of <laughs> interested to see that happen. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I agree that there's a valuation tilt. And so, yeah. you know, I do think the defensive way is, is right, that you can't just step out and not participate, right? That opportunity yes. costs can be really high, right? Yeah, and, and as far as the complaints of the Fed printing go, they can still go a very long way. Right. Um, despite forever, the US yeah. having, yeah, okay. despite them having the best quarter forever, right? You know, Turkey, yeah. when they had hyperinflation, their stock market was up 65,000% in 2017. <laughs> right? I, I use that as a case study in class, <laughs> right? But when you correct for it in real terms, right, in terms of quantities of things purchased, yes. then I think that's a totally different conversation. Um, yeah. And, and so this is, what we you know, can do as investors back. is, yeah. This is going back to the point. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you know, sorry I, to interrupt. You know, yeah, even though sure. I said five minutes, we are 15 minutes over. But the good part is, I think everyone's requesting for a part two of this episode because they all find it so useful that they want a second session as well. So get prepared for that. Uh, <laughs> you know, this I, I agree with them. You know, you can't cover this in uh, one uh, one session. And yeah, it's very complex are, material, yeah. Yeah, and most of them who actually tuned in haven't actually left the session as well. So even though it's a Friday evening at six to seven, we're discussing macroeconomics instead of beer and wine or uh, uh, getting together. So I mean, I find this really exciting. So uh, coming it's back better to better with the, beer and wine. Yeah, it's even better with beer and wine. I agree with you. So coming to some of the Q and A, um, I think you both can see some Q and A. But I just want to touch on one uh, couple of questions myself. So. Uh, even though the Fed is printing money uh, left, right, and center, and I think there's an oversupply of dollars, um, what are your thoughts on how it's, how much of these Fed policies affecting the Asian economies? Um, uh, you know, of course, uh, Bank of Japan is a very different story because they've had negative interest rates for the longest time. And I think if I know correctly for the last 20 years or so, uh, a lot of the uh, companies are now state owned one way or the other. You know, in Malaysia, we call them GLC companies. But in Bank of Japan or uh, in, Jap in, J in Japan, I would say they're also quasi-owned. I think in some cases, uh, Korean companies are also probably owned by uh, the government as well. How does it affect overall in terms of uh, the policies that Fed is making and you know pumping in more liquidity into the markets? Do you see a big impact in, um, in the Asian economies? That, that's a really good question. Um, and Peter, please correct me if you, you have a different reading of the facts. Um, despite the, the Fed pumping in a lot of money, mu the allocation of capital has still been distorted. I think in around March, people invested, US-based investors, and we think of those people as investors who are setting prices of many assets around the world. They have pulled money away from emerging markets, right? And so actually what we've seen is that there's a lot of dollars going around and yields in the US are very low. However, in some of the emerging countries in Asia, credit is still actually fairly hard to come by, right? And it's not really helped by the fact that some countries in Asia have an exchange rate management policy, 
right? So when the U.S. does something by construction, MAS has to take some action also, right? Um, I think without the Fed pumping, likely what would have happened was the U.S. dollar would have gotten stronger, right? Oh, yeah. So what we saw was that the U.S. dollar got a lot stronger right when the crisis happened around mid-March, and then the U.S. dollar trended down a little bit, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think the question is, Anand, that's a good one. Like from the perspective of people in Asia, right? I think the bottom line becomes, do you like a stronger dollar or a weaker dollar, right? And as someone who lives in Singapore or Malaysia, are you investing in global financial markets or Malaysian financial markets? Because interestingly, what you would have seen is US financial markets are doing extremely well, but other financial markets are not at all, right? And so, you know, to the extent that we're sitting here in Asia and we want to participate in some of the kind of strange times, we would need to be managing a global portfolio, right? You need to be investing around the world. Right. Uh, and I, I think there's a few other questions also. So let me sort of move into some broader macroeconomic questions. Um, uh, uh, again, I think since we touched about, uh, we touched on the topic of the U.S. market doing so well, uh, Mario Velez has a question which says, uh, U.S. stock market just had its best quarter in the last 20 years, almost 40%. So all this is Fed-based. Are we going to see a crash when money printing stops are no longer feasible? Well, I think the, the, the question is, should, the question really should be, can the Fed afford to let the markets crash? Um, or well, not even crash, again, yeah, I, I would, let me rephrase that. Can the Fed afford to let the markets drift down to a reasonable level, i.e., you know, rekindle uh, true price discovery mechanism? And my answer is no, they cannot, right? Uh, as in, you know, uh, any other Ponzi scheme, <laughs> you have to keep it going. It's very simple. So, you know, I think the good news, at least in the short, maybe even the, the short to medium term, uh, you know, as, as, as we had discussed, is, is the Fed will just keep printing. They will do anything possible uh, to keep uh, the valuations at, at very high levels. Um, you know, I think I'm quite convinced of that. Uh, and they've both said it and demonstrated it. So if the Fed did stop printing, would the markets crash? Without a doubt. There's absolutely no question. I mean, you would have the mother of all collapse, right? Uh, will the Fed do that? Absolutely not. I mean, but does that also mean that, you know, what about the other countries? I mean, U.S. stock market is up, but do you think it's going to have a ripple effect and say uh, the countries that are opening up uh, will also have a sort yeah. of a spillover? Yeah, look, I mean, I think if you look at it, you know, apart from, if you look at, you know, like at all the various markets around the world, and it's, you know, apart from the countries like Italy, you know, uh, Indonesia, uh, as an example, that have gotten really hit pretty hard and have not managed necessarily the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, uh, you know, all that well, and their economies got hit, you know, disproportionately. You know, those are still lagging, but even those are, have recovered substantially from, from March, right? So, so that, uh, you know, liquidity wave, and let's not forget, it's not just, you know, we were, what it was, I mean, focusing on Fed, but it's all the central banks around the world. Right. You look at the ECB, you look at the Bank of Japan, you know, all central banks around the world have had obviously extremely uh, loose monetary policies. You know, even I mean, you, know, you, you can just look at Malaysia. Right. You know, they've uh, cut multiple times and they'll cut again in, in the coming meeting. So it's not it's not just you know, it's not just the US. It's not just the Fed that liquidity, uh, easy money uh, policies are in every single country. And, you know, I would say that uh, every single country has, uh, been, you know, the markets have benefited with a very few exceptions. It's just that the US, you know, that tsunami of liquidity has been greater than anywhere else. And hence the markets there have, uh, you know, bubbled up much, much more than, than anywhere else. And, you know, I think that's an interesting question, which is what Ben was, was saying earlier, you know, is that sustainable? And you know, I don't know. That that's another one. You know, I think just like the it, the levels, the overall levels of the markets, clearly, you know, I think will 
you know, sort of stay at least around with the levels where they are because the central banks won't let them correct to, to you know, more reasonable levels. So we can I mean, sort of agree on that. Based on some the of questions. the questions. Based yeah, on some of the sorry. research and discussions that we've had, you know, I think either the countries are monetary policies are either based on an exchange rate or an interest rate. So in particularly Malaysia is interest based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they've been they've been cutting, you know, they've been obviously cutting to to inject additional liquidity. The question as an investor that, you have to ask yourself. That is the right thing to do, right? Yeah. I mean, well, that's what they're yeah. creating. I, mean, I don't want people to miss out on that, right? You're stating that mm -hmm. central banks are pumping liquidity. It's exactly what they should be doing at this time. It's what they were built to do to stop Absolutely. financial collapse. Yeah, right? without a doubt. Now, where where we are, are, are gonna we agree, I think very we, sorry, we very very much disagree is, you know, how tightly or how nuanced can policy get in during a a crisis, right? I mean, with the financial crisis, the Fed had days and weeks to get things done, right? Same with COVID. If you didn't do anything, the markets would be frozen, right? And one could argue that's worse than trying to pick it back up. So, you know, going to Mario's question, how much of the past 20 years of stock market returns is based on the Fed? That's a really tough question. And I don't think we can answer that, right? Again, correlation is not causation. We can't prove that the Fed increasing liquidity is what caused prices. Now, again, valuations can come down in multiple ways. One is prices come back down, right? And the other is earnings rise. I think the question becomes how much of, how much of each do you need, right? I think we agree that we're going to need a little bit of prices and valuations correcting for sure, but how much, right? Yeah. I think you're pretending that, a, you're just holding the valuation <laughs> and bringing it back down without changing any of the fundamentals which I think that, really short changes, you know, the global economy. I think that, you know, the global economy on average grows. Things have gotten better over the past 20 years. Uh, we're going through a blip of anti-globalization, but the forces of economics still go on, right? And to the extent that market forces prevail and we can allocate resources in a better and more efficient way with more productivity, you know, ten, things will tend to grow. What I want to point out is your comment about productivity decreasing, that's not right. It's productivity growth is decreasing. Yes, so we're going at I'm, a slower rate. Exactly, um, which is so, the only way you can grow GDP. Yeah, correct. The, the so let, productivity let, let factor. Me, yeah. So let me add that, you know, I mean, I think we're discussing quite an interesting thing about productivity. So there's a question from David. Uh, so in terms of productivity, what I see uh, is happening is, uh, overall, everybody's trying to preserve cash. A lot of the companies are trying to preserve cash. They don't want to spend the same kind of money that they were uh, they were spending before. So there's a uh, there's really a tightening of the belt from the company side. So if taken that into account, what about unemployment figures in many countries? Are they accurate? Are they skewed? Are they undercount solution? Are they flawed data in flawed perception, flawed policy? What are you guys thoughts on that? Uh, this is a question from David actually. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not an expert in unemployment figures uh, at all. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting that, you know, I think you are seeing governments, you know, in a way trying to manage psychology, right? So you look at China and, you know, the unemployment figures barely budged, which, you know, is laughable, obviously. Uh, so, you know, there's estimates that, you know, the real, you know, from the various research firms in, in, in China that are more independent that, you know, the real unemployment is double what the official figures are. Um, and what's interesting is that you see that now, you know, in the U.S. as well, which is, you know, it's a topical question, David, uh, which is obviously we had the, uh, uh, the unemployment figures come out uh, from the BLS and, uh, you know, it's funny because nobody questions it, but then, you know, you look at the numbers and, uh, you know, the same day you had the Department of Labor releasing figures that said, you know, approximately uh, 30 some odd, I think 32, 33 million uh, Americans are collecting unemployment insurance. And then you have the BLS going out saying that, uh, you know, the unemployment rate to drop to 11.1%, uh, but I'm not really sure if they, thing that uh, people don't have calculators, but you know, you just have to divide one with the other, 
and that gets you to about you know 300 million uh, uh, implied uh, uh, working population, which is obviously impossible. Uh, likewise, you know that number of people, a number of Americans that are collecting uh, unemployment insurance has gone up 20x, right? So it was about one and a half million uh, a year ago, uh, according to the Department of Labor. So, you know, the number of people collecting unemployment insurance has gone up 20x, and yet, you know, the Bureau of Labor, uh, BLS, is expecting people to believe that the unemployment rate has only gone up to 11%. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely, you know, I think there's definitely statistics management. Um, like, I mean, I, mean it's, it, I don't think it's management. Many of these things are designed to capture, you know, maybe what you you think is, it, it's not capturing what you think is unemployment, right? Their definition is very strict on what unemployment is. And everyone agrees they don't count people who quit looking for jobs and just gave up, right? Um, so, you know, I- No, but this is different. Again, this, wait, wait, this, this is- this is very different though, right? And, and you know, I, I hear that excuse a lot, Ben. Uh, what, but what I'm saying is very interesting. You know, this is not, we are taking the data from uh, the department, the US Department of Labor, right? Which has the actual number of people that are collecting on insurance, right? The BLS data is based on surveys. They call up people and they ask them questions. So which one do you want to believe? Do you want to believe the Department of Labor data as to how many people they're actually paying unemployment claims to, or do you want to believe the BLS survey data? And that's the I, real question. I, I, those two, so the thing is those, I just want to end this here because we're getting into a factually incorrect territory. So I just have to correct it. Those two things are consistent with each other. You can have what looks like artificially low unemployment numbers. They're designed to capture exactly what they're capturing. And you can have a lot of unemployment insurance numbers. I think the question becomes, when we're thinking about the health of the economy, what becomes the right measure? Now, I, I agree with you, likely the better measure for the times now is the weekly unemployment insurance claims, right? So yeah, absolutely. I, we're in agreement there. The thing is, it's not some government conspiracy to manipulate numbers. Now, China, different story, I understand. You can't believe GDP numbers, you should use you know, how much electricity they use, right? That's research done by Chiang Tai She at Chicago. Um, but the bottom line is, I think, what's stopping companies from investing and hiring people? I think a lot of what's going on now is related to uncertainty, right? And the question becomes, how much of that uncertainty is dependent on policy, right? And how much of it is dependent on health policy and how much of it is dependent on fiscal policy and how much of it's dependent on monetary policy. I think we'll agree that monetary policy has done pretty much as much as it could, right? And we still have fiscal policy that probably still needs to get its act together. And we have public health policy that you actually need to be controlling the spread of the virus. Right. So, I mean, measurement aside and the U.S., you know, we can go into the details of the U.S. And I agree that there's measurement issues everywhere else. Um, Thai, the black market is huge. Right. The informal sector. Right. Most of those people have no job now. Unemployment presumably is 100 percent. Right. And yet it's not showing up in the numbers. So I agree. And the question becomes, yeah. how well informed are the policymakers? And I think that's really the crux of the problem. You can have flawed measures. You can have measures with measurement error, right? Now the question becomes, do the policymakers understand the measurement error? Um, you know, and the, economists, yeah. the economists at the BLS understand that. However, they are not in control of policy, right? And so that's the big disconnect there. I think the, the agreement here is that there are issues that are coming in from the ground up. There are issues at all levels. Um, but at, at the top level, I do think policy needs to be enacted in a very evidence-based fashion. And I think actually our opinions should be based off of evidence also, right? And so, you know, we have the data, we can discuss more about it. I'd love, actually, the number you quoted, I'm actually using in class because it's so misleading, right? And I'm going to ask my students. To 11%. Yeah. 
the eleven yeah. percent. Yeah, no, it's completely misleading. It's hundred percent misleading. Yeah, it's it's okay, impossible. Guys, uh, <laughs> I've got two last questions: one on investing and yeah. one on a theory from Ray Dalio. Uh, mm -hmm. So since we're discussing, uh, you know, I, I, this question is more to Ben. Um, I'm going to sort of switch gears to Ben because. Um, uh, this is on an investment side, and I know uh, you've been investing based on value and stuff like that. So the next question from an anonymous anonymous attendee is: um, uh, Since there is a massive printing of money, how should people uh, with capital deploy or invest? And how are you investing in uh, in your company? I mean, it, it, both of you can actually take the answers as well. I mean, question as well uh, from Ben's point of view as well as Peter's point of view. Okay, so yeah, I, I can take share a bit. Oh, you want, oh, me? Okay. No, no, go ahead. Uh, uh, that's a good question. I think what we brought, we talked about involves a lot of uncertainty around policy, right? Um, monetary, fiscal, health, everything. Um, and uncertainty about growth trajectories. And again, I'm not in the business to do forecasting. That's a really tough game. Um, and so for me, you know, I have a diversified portfolio right? And some countries will do well, some countries won't do well. On average, I hope that, you know, in the long run, it does well on average. And we talked a bit about asset prices in the U.S. seemingly out of whack, right? Uh, so we have a quantitative value tilt, right? So we do bet that valuations will converge, right? And they'll converge in multiple dimensions. There's price of U.S. versus within U.S. value versus growth, and then U.S. with international. So there are multiple dimensions of divergence now, which we think would need to converge in the long run. And the question becomes, how long is the long run, right? And we get back to this question again, how long can you play the musical chairs? Um, and so that's, it's a tough game to be in. And so, you know, given that Chicago Global has some outside investors um, we can't just be really high conviction value and down 50%, right? That's beyond the pain threshold. So we have a blended approach that we have different sources of return drivers so that overall we have a nice defensive long-term strategy. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we, we agree. I mean, we, we, you know, I think you and I agree a lot on this, uh, Ben, except, you know, I think obviously from your perspective, you're, you know, a bit more, you know, obviously they need to be short, more short-term focused as for me, I'm more long-term focused, but, you know, fundamentally, I think uh, I, I completely agree in that, yes, you know, clearly we are uh, at extreme valuations, but, you know, you have to be in the market, uh, uh, whether you like it or not. And so, you know, the only game left is really the arbitrage of, the uh, dispersion of the valuations, right? And the dispersion is, you know, between growth versus value, where the dispersion is, again, at uh, historical extremes. Uh, and then U.S. versus global, where, you know, again, the dispersion is, is at historical uh, extremes. You know, if you look at the actual numbers, the U.S. Uh, market is at an all-time record of 2.3x of developed markets. Um, versus a historical average of 1x. So it just tells you, you know, the US has been disproportionately, especially the last decade or so, uh, bid up. Um, question is, you know, can that continue? Uh, perhaps for some, some point, but you know, there is definitely, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, reversal to the mean thesis that, you know, should work out over time. Um, same thing with, you know, from my personal perspective, uh, I like to focus on dividends, um, you know, again, it's, it's old fashioned, but, uh, you know, in a extremely low rate requirement, as uh, extremely low rate environment, uh, to me, focusing on, uh, dividends, uh, makes more sense than necessarily chasing growth, uh, because, uh, you know, you're going to have very low GDP growth. There's no question about that, uh, over the next, uh, you know, once we kind of, uh, at, over the next few years, recover back to trend line, you're going to have very, very low GDP growth. There's no question. Um, so what do you want to do in a low GDP growth environment? Do you want to be, you know, chasing the few, you know, high growth stocks that are extremely overvalued? Or do you want to focus on, on, on returns? Um, and to me, uh, you know, high dividend stocks that have solid balance sheets and good business models and are cash generative are really the way to go. And, and they have been, you know, unloved. So they are still relatively cheap. 
Yeah, so um, we've okay. seen uh, our profitability factor do well, but you're right. The valuation, you know, that dividend investing sale has been punished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one last question from Satyajit Sharma. Uh, he's asking, how seriously would we like to take Ray Dalio theory that we are at the end of a long term debt cycle? So with that, we can actually close the session as well. Yeah, that's all you, Peter. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, that's that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Is <laughs> there's absolutely no question. I mean, we are at the end of the debt cycle of all debt cycles in human history. Um, you know, so my view, and you know, I know Ben, you you, you may not agree, but my view is that uh, there is only one way, and which is which is down, right? So there will have to be deleveraging and there will be deleveraging and that's what Ray Dalio you know has uh, predicted and I am 100% agree with with him you know he, he has studied the history yeah, of these been right about and, the markets yeah and, and look you know it's <laughs> there, there's just no way there's nowhere else for the world to go and that, that's it's quite simple you know you cannot go off into the moon at uh, you know 400, 500, 600, 700 uh, percent uh, debt to GDP is just not sustainable. Uh, you know, we're already at uh, probably 350 by the end of this year. Once you you know factor in the increase in, in in global leverage and decrease in GDP, we can go. I mean, that's that's extreme. We cannot go much higher than that. Uh, so so there will be a reckoning. Um, you know, the only question is, will it be order orderly uh, or will it be disorderly? And the history tells us that, you know, where you had the, you know, the, the one, uh, the one uh, thesis that Ray Dalio has, as if you've kind of been reading and watching his stuff, you know, he has this thesis of beautiful deleveraging <laughs> is how you get out of the uh, long-term debt cycle. And I think that actually is just silly, really, because that's never happened in history and, and uh, it's not very likely to happen now. Usually, the way these things end is in in a very very disorderly collapse. Um, so not pretty, but um, if you you know if history uh, rhymes, as the saying goes, uh, that's what we're in for. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, thank uh, you, gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. Uh, I think you wanted a research paper from Ben. Uh, from Ben, I think you can connect with him directly either on LinkedIn or one of the chat groups. Uh, so and I you know if he wants to share that with you, that's great. Uh, for the rest of you, this session is recorded and will be available on YouTube channel. Uh, so you guys can uh, listen to that later. But to a fantastic audience who've actually stayed through the entire evening, um, I'll definitely work with uh, Ben and Peter for uh, round two uh, for you guys. But otherwise, uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to CK. Uh, thanks to the, our uh, alumni group in Kuala Lumpur who actually worked hard to put this together. Uh, thanks for Ben and uh, Peter to take the time for, for this session. Uh, I usually don't like to rush the sessions because uh, if there's interesting content going on and if the people are staying back, I usually let it run and uh, that's exactly what happens tonight as well. So off to another good weekend. Uh, thanks to everybody and cheers and peace. Great. Yeah, thanks. It's been a fun nice discussion. Week, everyone. Thank you. Thank Take care. You.